but it's time to set up our winner's match for this group. We have Denial Esports versus MVP Black. Let's take a look at these teams. After the disbanding of C9, I knew that I still wanted to play competitive heroes. And at that time, the only one of my teammates who was continuing to play was K1 Pro. So we ended up just coming up with the idea that we'd make our own roster and then qualify for BlizzCon that way. So we looked around through a couple orgs and Denial just seemed like they had the most to offer for us in terms of just getting prepared for BlizzCon and getting the practice we need. Our goal was to be just the best team possible. Financial freedom. We just were able to relax and focus on our gameplay more than anything else. We came together. And the best idea that we figured out was to bring in iDream, who's someone that we've played with before. We know that he excels on land, and his hero pool was something that we really needed. They just told me one night that they were having problems with the team and that they were looking to have a roster swap and just offered me a spot. I said, sure, why not? That's when I found out that the price pool got doubled. He's one of the best players in the scene. He's won BlizzCon twice and coming back, trying to get a three-peat. We'll see if it can happen. I think Denial Esports is looking to prove that even though no one expects them to win this tournament, that the three of the five players that were champions before are still champion level when it comes to a BlizzCon tournament. And we definitely want a chance to play against Astral Authority on the big stage. They're a really strong team and I'm really proud and impressed with how much they've improved over this past year, but I still think we're better. We have a lot of emotional players who need to be really hyped to play at their potential, and BlizzCon is just the perfect setting for that. And the amount of practice and work we've been putting in the past month and a half, I think we have what it takes, and I think we can win the whole thing. Three returning BlizzCon champions, iDream joining back on the team, trying to be that key to victory. Will it be enough to defeat their opponents? Let's take a look at MVP Black. For those who don't know MVP Black, you probably should. They are, without a doubt, the most successful team ever in competitive Heroes of the Storm history. They have never lost to any other team other than Korean teams. There's a lot on the line for this team that basically was denied BlizzCon last year, but in this case, they actually are here, and they're one of the big favorites. They need to show up to prove that, in fact, they are the best. MVP Black, an absolute monster of a team. We just saw them come off a big victory. And when it comes to Denial, they do have a bit of an experience with slaying Koreans at BlizzCon, at least. Last year, infamous with that murky pickup. Do you think there's any chance they have the kind of compositions that could still catch the Korean teams off guard? I want to let you guys in on a little conversation I had this morning on the <laughs> shuttle ride over, as a matter of fact. And it was with Sake. And I talked to him. I said, what do you guys think about Denial? Just like, just open-ended question. Like, what do you guys think about Denial? He's like, he basically referenced last year about like, oh, somehow like they managed to pull it off and they were a really good team and there's still three members. And I was like, so what do you think? He's like, I honestly don't know. Like, they don't know. Like, and, and we've seen from drafts from Denial, like if you were to say, hey, what does their drafts look like? I'd be like, I don't really know half the time because they just play a bunch of crazy stuff. They have a core part of what they do, and they revolve around a lot of key players. But those three heroes in particular are massive to their success. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And I mean, for MVP, this is also... I mean, they are they are the favorite. There's a huge amount of pressure, so they're going into this match. They are probably going to try and play it safe once again. They have a lot of strategies that they can save up as well. But I completely agree. They are now in a situation where they have to test the waters a little bit because it's, for them also, of course, one of these situations where they don't get a lot of practice that goes across regions. As soon as you said MVP is the favorite, Wolf just lit up. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's no secret. Uh, I, I commentate Korea. Uh, you know, I, I cast OGN's leagues all year long and last year as well. They've been a team that's been in every single finals 
of any tournament they've played in. They've made every single finals. They have never played a tournament and not gone all the way to a grand final. So they're the big favorites here. They're the most consistent. Here's the Storm team we've ever had. And I really do, you know, look at this as like, for Denial, if it, if I'm making the calls, I'm saying, let's not show anything here. Let's just play a standard series. Let's play a standard best of three. Uh, and then, of course, get out of the group in the final consolation match. Because I really, uh, there there is the other side of the coin. You could try to cheese out here and somehow get out of the group in first place. But I just don't think that's the right approach here. Well, if I, I want to I wanna counter some of what you're talking about. They're a dominant team. They're a number one team. I'm not going to dispute the fact that they're a, a top team here at BlizzCon and in the world. When we've looked at them statistically and we've watched some replays and stuff, they're not as dominant as they were early this year. And they haven't been since summer. Like, you watch them all the time. What What is – are we just – are we spoiled by the fact that they were so good early this year? To be totally honest, I feel like the, the main reason they don't look as dominant is the rest of the world is, is catching up a little bit. And the rest of Korea has grown with them. When you look at their, their failures in Korea, um, you know, when you look at DK, when they lost to DK last year, both teams were close in skill level. Then when you looked at the spring season, they were way better than TNL, which is basically the reformed DK. And going forward, we had the rise of better teams like Tempest, which became Tempo Storm. Mighty looked strong as well. And now, of course, we have Ballistic. So you have the growth of Korea. They don't look as strong versus the rest of those, but also against the world. Um, you know, sometimes they, they make mistakes against other teams because the rest of the world is also closing that gap. Alrighty. Well, we are setting up for this match and we are going straight into Infernal Shrines, Wolf. Where do you think they're going to play? How are they going to approach this? We've already seen them playing it once. Take us through it. Yeah, I'll take you guys through this map right now. So you want to break down basically the lanes on this map. Because for me, when I think about MVP Plaque on this map in particular, you think about how Rich likes to play in the top lane. So if you look at these lanes, you look at the top lane right up here. Rich, say he's on red side, okay? There's a line you could draw in the top lane here. Rich will always stay around here if he doesn't have vision. That's something to look at how he plays the top lane specifically on heroes like Illidan and Thrall. Sometimes you'll see uh, a top laner come and cross this kind of line and go over here to try to, to put some damage on the turret, you know, kill some ammo and things like that. And that's something that, that Rich just simply doesn't do because sometimes you can see ganks come up through here. You can see somebody hiding in, in bushes and, and vents over here. And so you got just keep in mind how he plays up there. It's going to be very hard to kill him. And if Denial is trying to find damage on this particular hero, I think it's going to be a mistake. So that's really the main thing I wanted to focus on this map. We already had an overview of it earlier. So that's uh, that's about it. So we saw Rich playing all Iraq on this map. Kaldor, where do you think all Iraq's going to sit in this series? I definitely can see other like ones again being played here. I mean, he has such a huge kill potential and just to blow up a hero, they have a very aggressive play style. We've seen them play a lot of Illidan in the past. And if you listen to any kind of like team that played against them, what they always emphasize is the individual strength that we have on players like Rich and that he always will find opportunity to kill the, uh, you. That pressure, especially at the beginning of the game, is something that they can snowball to his early victory. If I could go up and ask Glaurung a question right now. Glaurung's the melee player for Denial. He can make or break a fight because he gets really aggressive at times. Yeah. He's going up against the number one ranked melee player in the world in Rich. There's got to be pride that comes in when you're on the other side. They both play an amazing Illidan. Glaurung loves to play Zeratul. There's going to be a huge battle over the melee heroes. And I got to think that Glaurung is going to have his eyes firmly set on Rich. I'm actually really excited about that. This team, like the two teams, I think are going to be great. But that matchup is what I'm most excited I am for. exactly on the same page as you because these are like two titans colliding when it comes down to it. Like Glaurung is definitely, this is his first time at a global like BlizzCon, right, for this player. He's so hungry for that title, and they know that. And truthfully, when you look at Denial as a team, he is a, he's really just one of those heroes that's driving their motivation and hungry for the win. One of the things that a lot of teams will tell you, a lot of players, is if you find yourself in such a situation where you play someone like Rich, the key thing to do is focus on the hero. Focus on the hero matchup and not on the player you're facing. Because once you start doing that and you know you're facing someone like Rich, you're in trouble already. So you got to have pride, though. Yeah. And, and I, I think that sometimes <laughs> kicks in whether you want it to or not. So the way that matchup goes, I mean, there's so much, there's so many dynamics to these two, two, these two teams. They're 
their drafts and their play styles and stuff like that. But that, for me, it's kind of like a personal, like, early Christmas gift. I get to watch <laughs> these two players because they're so good yeah. on those Melee heroes, and I, I can't wait to see them face off. I, I, mean, I think it's, it's really important to note, too, that when you look at Rich specifically as a player, um, you really want to look at Sign and Merry Day as well because without him, without them, he can't do anything. Like, he looks powerful on these heroes because he knows just how far this hero can go, and he never, ever really makes big mistakes on this hero. When you have these two players backing him up, that's why he has he gets so much value. You know, the Palms, the Vine Shields we saw when those were meta, leading up into just everything else that we have. Even, you know, Merry Day can play Medic. He can play Lieutenant Morales to keep him alive. There's just so many different heroes that really empower Rich to do what he wants to do. Yeah, this is going to be a very different matchup in general, I feel, because if we look at the first series where Denial faced against Reborn, uh, I Dream was getting away with whatever he wanted on Li Ming. He played Li Ming twice. He did anything he wanted. He was never really pressured. But when you throw someone like Rich in the mix, guess what? <laughs> he, can't, he can't get away with anything he wants. So Li Ming, her kit in general, when she gets the resets, she really does a great job snowballing those fights. Huge burst potential in her kit. And oftentimes we do see the wave of force just to have a bit of additional control in those battles. I mean, the cool thing with Li Ming right now is that there's a lot of diversity in her kit. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can take at different levels to be able to deal with different types of opposition. You can see that's one of the, the heroic abilities disintegrate. We've seen a lot of wave of force, as you talked about, but the power, the resets, and the potential of Li Ming look for her to be a highly contested hero. And believe it or not, we oftentimes say Infernal Shrines isn't necessarily one of Li Ming's best, but this is actually one that these teams have no problem running this hero on. Sure. I, I think actually one of the, the things I want to talk about going to this draft is Alarak. Can Glarung play Alarak well? Because that can be one way to deny this from Rich is to simply take it yourself early or ban it. But I mean, if Glarung was good at it, it can be twofold uh, a good thing for denial because they're, uh, no pun intended, denying that from <laughs> MVP Black and then he's going to take it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, we haven't really seen him on All Right yet. That's a big question mark. I was saying that in the first series. Will he bust it out? Does he have it in his arsenal? Yes, we saw him playing Sonya, and he hasn't done that in a long time, and that, that's, a good, that's a good sign to see him expanding his hero pool because at the start of this season, that was the way teams were drafting against Denial. They were really just constricting Glaurung's uh, pool of heroes, but he has expanded it so much. This is Glaurung right here. Moments after they qualified for BlizzCon, he made the comment, I'm spending the next month and a half trying to uh, strengthen my hero pool. And you can see right now, the win-loss record, forget that. These guys are a completely different team with iDream, but this is kind of the engine that makes this team run in the sense that where he goes, you know his team has to follow because he is super aggressive. But he has three battle-tested members from the former Cloud9 that have his back and have his support, and they actually, they actually reel him in to make him better. And I think that's one of the things is we've seen this rise of Glaurung in the two regionals since he's been on this team. And that's why I think that he's one of the keys to victory for them. One thing that I want to point out is that one of the weaknesses that Korean teams traditionally have a bit is scouting. Oftentimes, they don't really put in that effort to find out who is the key player of the opponent's team, what's happening here. They, of course, try to scrim, and then they get a bit of an idea. But when we were talking about like finding out like matches, looking at Nexus games, for example, some of them didn't even know that took place. They were standing there. Yeah. They, they never <laughs> scouted out any of this. So that just shows, for one, the confidence, but also, at the same time, a bit of a weakness that you might be able to exploit. Yeah, overconfidence is, is always a big weakness. And it's something I've spent a lot of time talking to the Korean teams here at this event about what they think about the other teams. And it is often the case, just simply they did not do any scouting. Um, I think the way that Korean teams look at matches like this, best of threes like this, is, okay, we're going to win it no matter what. We're going to feel it out in the series live because all the things that they could study from these teams are a little bit dated. Um, but if they've run into any challenges, they just take it as it comes. And I think that's a strength of, you know, how Korean teams play and how they prepared for best or, you know, how they handle best of threes. But I definitely agree with you, Calder. It can be a weakness at times. Alrighty, well, we are ready for the draft, the draft for the first match or the first game in this series. Let's jump right on into it. Infernal Shrines, man. This, you know, this is a map that or a battleground that we saw quite a bit of. And then it's just like, wait a minute, we don't really want to play against it. But one of Glaurung's favorite heroes that we see is Kerrigan. I would be absolutely surprised if MVP Black doesn't ban out Kerrigan here. This is actually one of the maps where MVP Black themselves play Kerrigan quite a bit. I mean, we've seen them with Kerrigan combos, with uh, ETC, with Diablo especially, and I could see them try and pick that up as well. So you're totally right. Kerrigan is definitely one of the heroes to watch out for here. I like the Malfurion ban uh, here as well, because Malfurion is something that Black likes to use with ETC specifically. Also with Alarok, with the ETC ban coming down immediately, they don't want to use Malfurion, and they don't want to give it away either. So it's a very intelligent choice. 
uh, going into Black's first ban. I, I guess the thought process is that if you early pick Kerrigan, perhaps they're afraid of a uh, of a potential counter. Alarak is one of those counters that could really come into play. So instead, they lock in Murden, King Caffeine, known as one of those godlike Murden <laughs> players. So obviously, there's a reason, but that, that gives Kerrigan. <laughs> yeah. Over now, now this flag. is this is the classic for denial though. They do often have this high prioritization of the warriors. They like to get that locked in quick, but now they've left them open to not only Kerrigan but Tyrael. And this is something that we see a lot of for MVP Black. Yeah, I mean Tyrael is is in Korea. I feel like utilized best. We saw yes. Tempo Storm use that, uh, formerly known as Tempest, back in the Summer Championship to great effect with Grey Main, but. We also saw Dami use Kerrigan the same way. I mean, these melee heroes are empowered so much by Tyrells of Vulnerability. And with the priority that MVP Black usually puts on Kerrigan on Infernal Shrines, Denial Esports, they will have known about this. They said, okay, we want to have Muradin here. If they pick Kerrigan right now, that's totally fine. If not, we have a chance to pick up ourselves. And they go <laughs> into the Illidan with this. All right. So we have a Muradin Illidan here already. Remember, we talked in the drafts before how Illidan was usually counted out immediately by Muradin picks, by Brightwing counter picks. So right now they feel confident enough to actually play him against the Kerrigan with the stuns and the Cheerio. He needs someone to empower him, though. Yeah. And I would like to see a Tastar pick yeah. up here with them, to be telling us. Tastar's one of the greatest solo Shriners on this map. So if you're pushing a lane, you're pushing an objective, you can leave Tastar there. He can solo clear that. Uh, and he's going to empower the Illidan. Also, Tastar works well with Kerrigan. We don't necessarily know if Black's going to pick it up, but if you take this here, you deny that from Black as well. So I think the Tastar pick here is what I choose. Um, perhaps they're afraid of a ban on a heal they want to use with Illidan specifically, but I think the Tastar is a good pick. That, that was my question as well, is do you pick up Tastar? They've been known to run a lot of Brightwing, and that's, you know, it counters a lot of those dive style heroes. But at the same time, if you don't pick up Tassadar, does that make Tassadar ban worthy right. against the other team? Because that's actually one of the heroes that MVB prioritizes more so than not on Infernal Shrines. You get good value on the Shrine itself, and instead they pick it up. I love this yeah. pickup wolf. This is like pretty much what we've seen with Illidan like all day long. You want to have the double support to really empower him to make him just survival enough to go really deep. And with Black already running that Kerrigan and the Terriel, you really have to make sure that Illidan doesn't die to an early stun and gets disabled there. Black, of course, has quite a couple of counter heroes that they can still pick to put a lot of pressure on Illidan. Yeah. There's a lot of options here. Vala has been banned out here from MVP Black. It's very just a nice safe ban. Tankus is coming. Yeah. I for <laughs> well, for I denial? Or I, for a pick, you think? Oh, I think if MVP by it gets an opportunity, they're picking up Tychus, no doubt. Well, I think uh, going into this next ban phase for Denial Esports, it's a little bit less clear-cut what they right. ban here, because obviously they are going with the Tassar themselves. Um, I really don't think you're ever really thinking about the blinds of Lili, for example. In this case, it's not what Black <laughs> traditionally does against uh, Illidan. Um, although we have seen pro teams in this circuit do that many times in the past. It's a tough ban here, because you could ban, like, for example, Rhaegar, but you're not really too worried about that. They're going to ban Tychus I love it. instead. I like this. I guess it's the best overall choice yeah. here. Well, when you consider that the other bans, when you're looking at support like Rhaegar, Thrall, or excuse me, Uther is still a really good option. Brightwing is still a really good option. You're not really locking them out of that. But the Tychus ban, you just remove that from the table, and you know they're very strong with Do you that. know how easy it is as Tychus? You throw your grenade in there, and you snipe anywhere between five to eight of those skeletal defenders against that. I mean, especially you say Tassadar. Why don't you go ahead and throw that side down a little bit? Do a little damage. Here comes a grenade. I just stole those from you. That, that's how yeah. it works on this map. There's so much utility and just overall play that Tychus brings to this map, especially for MVP Black, that I like that. I really like the band pattern that they have and also the picks, but I'm just like looking at this carry again and I imagine how Rich is going to just like play that and it just scares me so much. With the Rhaegar support, then also the shield, the Li Ming behind that, I mean, this setup for MVP Black is just looks so scary. Yeah, there's not a, a whole lot of range damage on the side of Denial Esports they can use here left in the pool. Falstad comes to mind here, but is he going to be enough? Is that going to be a safe enough pick here? Obviously, he has a lot of mobility, has his barrel roll, things like that. I'm wondering if they're going to choose that because they don't have very many other options with Vala and Tychus banned and Li Ming taken away. Kael'thas is something that you could use to poke. You can all use, also use his gravity laps to you... take Kerrigan into the sky, but... Kael'thas is... We'll see. That's not a hero we see in North America at this point. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking like it's still possible to try to go all in on the Illidan idea 
Abathur, sure, that comes to mind, but Zarya, like, very, very interesting as well. Well, one hero that we used to see quite a bit paired with Illidan, of course, is that Sylvanas, which also complements this map well. But how much does that lend towards Shrine Control? When you have Illidan, you have Tassadar, Sylvanas, you almost kind of got to have a little bit more damage. I mean, on certain maps, I think we'll see that strategy. I don't think it's out of the question. The fact that Uther was picked up here, I like that a lot, to be able to enable Illidan to go in and do a lot. But I really feel like they need some damage. I wouldn't be surprised by the Sylvanas, but there's definitely a big hole they need to fill right now. Totally right about that. They need some really decent range damage right now. Illidan is going to try and drive the fight and put the pressure on, but they need someone in the back line who's really constantly able to put that pressure out in terms of DPS. And MVP Black with Tyrael Sanctification, they already have a lot of presence on those shrines, so damaging them is not going to be easy. It's really going to be that battle between Illidan and Kerrigan trying to just go into the back line, I feel. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the more I think about this, Sylvanas is a good pick, but she's not She's not an amazing pick, you know? Even if they do choose her, I wouldn't disagree with the choice, but it's not amazing because you're gonna oftentimes get a lot of value from Savannah when you have an early lead, if you have big wave player, big pushing. They have Tassadar, but they're up against Kerrigan. If you're trying to push lanes early on, you are gonna get punished hard by the big CCs that are gonna be flying out from Rich. Cool Don will get Whoa. locked in uh, here. Okay. Whoa. We have seen him a little bit earlier in Gul'dan. If you get the stacking going with Corruption, you can do an, a massive amount of damage later on. He has great wave clear. But it's, as you guys already said, it's I, something that is not your everyday pick. It's not. Okay, so let's let's put this into perspective, all right? Just not too long ago in the European Nexus games, we saw Gul'dan brought out by Dignitas to mixed results. But <laughs> Infernal Shrines right now, I think, is one of Gul'dan's best maps. He has safe rotations. The only thing I think where he's threatened most is the top shrine. But the fact that he has different angles he can take, his fell flames that go out, as you talked about, trying to hit those corruptions, yep. but also the drain light. We saw a little bit of a rework. I haven't seen a lot of pros taking this, but at level four, the new rework to that level four talent to be able to drain life if that minion dies, I think there's some value. I don't think that's what they're going to be picking, but I think this is by far Gul'dan's best map, so I'm not terribly surprised, but I'm extremely hyped. And if you get those stacks going, just imagine the first few fights over the shrine, right? Heroes clustering up, and you get the corruption stacks going fast. <laughs> yeah. If you can make that happen, the damage I put on him is insane. At the same time, you really have to keep him alive. And that's where <laughs> Uther comes in. We talked about enabling Illidan with a Divine Shield, but it's also, it's your panic button. When Gul'dan is in trouble, you can still save him. Yeah, also, the, other, the other big thing is Sanctification takes a bit of time to wind up, and Horrify is Snap. So if you can land a Clutch Horrify and disorient that Tyrael from being able to Sanctification, that could be huge. Now, we're not really talking about the last pick here, which is going to be Kocha's Falstad for the side of MVP Black. And this is going to be a, a really powerful way to deal with Gul'dan. When you've got two big bursty mages, you can go and, and just kill Gul'dan right away before the fight even starts. Okay, but if you're Gul'dan and, and you see Falstad on one side, Leaming on the other. They have to get through skeletal defenders. We're talking about shrine control right now, and you have to get through some of that to be able to hit skill shots by leaming. At the same time, at level 13, Gul'dan has a talent to where he's able to reduce ability damage just by hitting somebody with fell flames. And that's a huge advantage, I think, to him, especially looking at the comp right now. I actually like this pick. I haven't seen it really worked too much. He's still kind of new with this latest rework in terms of the meta. I am extremely excited. I love Gul'dan right now. I do, and I, I'm really excited for him to be in this game. I think the other reason why I'm so pumped about it is like I Dream has always kind of done great things with the less common heroes, right? We, I mean, he's famous for the Rexar being one of his bigger picks, and this will, will very likely be I Dream in the driver's seat of Gul'dan. He's the most, I, I think, one of the most diverse players that we'll have in this tournament. We talk about hero pools a lot and stuff like that, but I Dream, defending champion. He's been around the scene a long time. He's played a lot of heroes, and he looks good on a lot of them. So I, I think that's definitely in their favor. Also, you mentioned Horrify a bit earlier to just disrupt Tyrael here, but just imagine about Carrigan just going one step too deep. <laughs> and then you get that perfect Horrify, and all of a sudden it's bye-bye Carrigan. And yeah, what do you do then? Yeah, I mean, although Kerrigan can get out of a lot of bad situations, she doesn't necessarily have the biggest health pool. And once you seclude her in those kind of situations, yeah, that's lights out. Especially if Tyrael isn't there. You know, if Tyrael's not there to help her out or she doesn't get her Ancestral, then it's going to be really difficult to survive if that happens. I do have faith in Rich's positioning, though, on Kerrigan. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is going to happen uh, very often, if at all. So we'll see <laughs> yeah. uh, how this happens in practice. In theory, the Gul'dan pick is solid, right? We can, we can argue for it, but... Let's see. Uh, for me, I'm just like, let's wait and see until the game starts because we've seen Gul'dan picks all around the world and the success, even though theory crafting sounds good, has been quite low. Well, I don't want to wait any longer. Let's get started with the game. Let's jump right on in with Kaldor and Wolf.
And ladies and gentlemen, the game is starting up and we have, of course, to the left side, it is Denial Esports. And we have APM currently playing Utah. We see Glorong on Illidan. We have iDream on Gul'dan as expected. K1 Pro on the Tassada and King Caffeine on Murden. And across this side of the map, Korea, MVP Black, Kyocha on False and Merry Day on Rig are Rich playing the Kerrigan, Sake on Liming and Sign pulling up the solo warrior, Tyrael. I'm really hyped now for this game. First of all, the Gul'dan pick, of course, absolutely amazing. That adds a little bit of spiciness to it. But I want to see that carry again. I want to see those plays. All right, Kyocha is looking like he might toss that hammering here, but no one is nearby. Denial Esports is already prepared for that and has, you know, avoided that. In fact, we won't even see it tossed out here by the range flex player of MVP Black. Kyocha going up to the top lane here. It looks like the matchup there will initially be between him and Illidan. And the middle of the map already just like checking this out a little bit, by the way. Talking Illidan, we have Utha still hiding right now, not showing on the map. Can still assist and maybe try to get a kill here with a quick stun on Falsa. So we're going to see that on the top lane very soon. That approach, the idea, just take down an early kill. Now, I was talking about the solo lane here, normally evolving Rich in the top lane. But as you guys can see on the mini-map, look at the gank potential here, or the gank attempt that Denial is doing. Kyocha knows. People are missing. They have full vision of both lanes and they checked in between lanes as well. So this is no coincidence that Kyocha is just going to stay back there. In fact, he didn't even know Muradin was there, but he didn't know where Muradin was in general. So he's staying back there. He's playing it safe. This is something that Black is known for is just simply in the top lane, never getting ganked. Although we do see stuns go down here on the sign. In fact, he commits to the Aldruids. Tastar is rotating up. Sign taking a lot of damage there, in fact, and K1 Pro gonna drop a little bit more down onto him there. Actually, a bit of a mistake there to commit to the Aldruin. It's going to take a lot of damage. Hyper aggression here is definitely coming out of denial. I really feel that this is how you have to play this. We have a double support early on with Illidan, and we've actually heard of the Korean teams oftentimes pushing super heavily with Illidan at the beginning of the game. So right now, denial is trying to give them a taste of their own medicine. Yeah, definitely uh, common to see. And let's see what happens on this first shrine. Obviously, the first team fight will occur. It's all going to really be about Rich, uh, what CCs he hits, and how well protected he is, as well as if Gul'dan is going to get that value, if he's going to get blown up right away by that double mage damage. And already, MV Black is just going to assert their dominance right onto this shrine, coming in first. And Denial is going to simply push the top lane. They're basically just saying, yeah, Kyocha, you can play safe back here all you want, but we're going to get structural damage done uh, if you're just here alone, forcing rotation of Sake up. And, uh, you know, I have to admit, MVP Black's rotation here is very late. It's very slow. Yeah, they didn't expect this. They expected them to rotate down, but right now, Illidan is getting that value that we've been talking about. They already have a slightly inexperienced. They don't really care about that first Punisher. They're just simply saying, like, yeah, take it. We're we totally fine. We're going to bait it in. We're going to burst it down, and then we're going to be good. And they do take away that healing fountain to the top, which is obviously a lot of the sustain you're going to see. Um, and we do see that uh, MVP Black is getting more EXP in both the mid and bottom lanes right now, and they are going to do their own structural damage with the Punisher here. Let's see if Denial Esports can stop them from getting the well. There's a very high chance Black can get it if they commit to it. And if they do, it'll basically be an even trade. Oh, the stuns! And they kill against Murden. Caffeine is down. Great play once again here by Rich on the carry game. Jumping onto Meridian, taking him on, and now they are looking for APM. They might get a second killer with Meridian jumping in, slowing him down, and the stun is good. Down he goes. There you go. Another kill here for MVP Black. And even though the swap there in the attempt to, to push top by Dial Sports was initially successful, MVP Black gets more value with the Punisher diving that turret there. I like what K-Pro is doing right now, hiding himself and also getting a little bit of EXP, but this is what Korea does. Small advantages lead into bigger ones because they simply immediately invade. They know they have range damage here with the double mage. They're going to drop as much damage onto that well as they can through the, uh, the Merc camp. And it's just very solid play. All it takes is one kill, two kills, and you can invade like this. You can find so much value. It was the first Punisher, and they got those two kills. It enabled them to get over for the 4-2. Now they have a huge lead in experience, as is. When we're looking at the talents, Gul'dan went on one for the Pursuit of Flame. A stack talent here with a Fell Flame, and we have it with the improved Life Tap on level 4. But of course, at this time, we already have level 7 talents on the side for MEP for quite some time. Whereas Denial just now hit the next talent level. Yeah. Golden is going to take that camp to the top side, which is going to give a really strong push going forward. 
So that's something that Black will have to deal with. They do have false set up there, of course, though. So this is not as powerful as it would be versus a different composition that doesn't have that global presence because Falso can eventually clear this and apply to wherever he is needed. But they're going to take it early, relieving some of that pressure. They do have level 7 now. The key here is to make sure that they don't take a fight when Black has Tan, and they're fastly yeah. approaching it. Yeah, totally right on that, Wolf. And also, on that note, let's just talk about that level 7 for a moment. It's really one of those power spikes that we see for Denial, since they have access to Tassada, of course, with his level 7 talent going straight into Kala's Embrace, therefore helping them pre-fight a bit, just buff those health pools. And they, of course, are going to wait for their tens here, for those big fights. We've been talking about Horrify. Illidan is going to have a lot more survivability, but it's scary since the Shrine is activated and it's only half a level until we are seeing MVP Black on level 10 in their heroic abilities. I do want to say there's some of a big mistake from Sign to show himself so far into the bot lane. It looks like Denial didn't notice, they're not going to punish him for it, but they could have actually caught him rotating up. He is now just here in the mid lane and he's going back, he's just trying to soak right now. And because Kerrigan is on the table and Black is so close to 10, Denial is just going to allow Rich to solo Shrine this for the time being, and they're going to split and soak themselves. They do invade this, they are now looking for for Sign, as I mentioned before, but it's a bit too late. And Sign will be able to easily defend against this with the help of Kyocha and Sake. So could have perhaps caught him on the rotation back to the mid lane, but they didn't. And Rich is just getting this for free while they get two lanes worth of EXP as well. Also, of course, noteworthy is once again that MVP Black, they just realized, well, our opponent is not going to try to contest since we have level 10. So we have to split onto the rest of the lanes to make sure we don't fall behind in experience. Oftentimes you will see a team like Denial just like trying to trade in the Punisher for EXP, but MVP Black, they waited until they had vision and then said, okay boys, we're good, let's take position on the lanes, make sure that we don't fall behind the EXP or anything, and we can leave one single hero up at the Shrine to take the Punisher. I really like what we've been seeing from Denial in this series, starting from the beginning, is using this heavy pressure. This time it's going to be three last time, or this time it's going to be four, last time it was three. As it just pressure wherever Kyocha is, counter his global presence by just simply pushing his lane so hard that he's basically not even able to soak necessarily and starting to get structural damage. But the question is, will it be enough at the end? Last time it wasn't a positive trade for them. Idrim getting very low, has to be Divine Shielded there. Glauron goes in, but he's already so damaged. A nice isolation gust there as well. Wow, Idrim! He's still dying, Gul'dan is down, so is Illus in a double kill in a four versus five situation. Denial saying, yes, you can have our top four. We're going to push with five, and then we're going to take a five versus four fight on even talents. And even that backfired, Wolf. Yeah. Now they lose Uther too. This is a disaster. K1 Pro is going to be killed here as well. He's already used his dimensional shift. He will survive a bit longer, but this is going to be a big, big amount of value here for MVP Black. Now vastly approaching level 13. This will give him time oh. to clear the bot lane, and the mid lane is already massively pushed as they did steal these impalers. And let's not forget doing all of this. Up to the top lane, Carrigan and the Punisher doing work. Taking down the forward, eliminating the wall and the towers. And now we're seeing a three level lead, six kills against zero on the side of the Korean team. Exceptional play here by them once again. It's, you know, we talked about how Gul'dan can get value, but if you look at these fights, he's very rarely able to hit his skill shots. Why? Because they're so terrified of Kerrigan and Sign just getting in there, doing enough damage to burst him down. So he has to always be back. You see him throw the skill shots out, but they're not hitting heroes almost ever. And this is, again, one of the reasons why, in theory, Gul'dan works, but in practice, he's not successful here against the Korean team. This is absolutely blowing my mind how this fight at the bot lane went. Kerrigan was top, they knew it, and they said, okay, you can take the lane, we'll push with five, we're gonna hit 10 in time, and then we can get counter value. They had the option to simply rotate top, defend, and then take it from there, but they decided to be a little bit more aggressive about it. And I, I like the idea, but the execution was just not good enough. Even no. though there were only four heroes uh, at the bottom of the map, the Koreans just showing their individual skill, and oh my god, that was just beautiful. The Kyocha Gusta as well I want to go back to, because he, he did yeah. it at such an angle that he isolated one hero alone, and it's hard to do that, but if you come in at the right angle, you can do that, it gets massive value, he's going to force the retreat, and that was very well executed. We are going to see K1 Pro just simply dodge this combo here and back off, but Black is poised with two camps pushing right now to push this as hard as they can while probably sending Kerrigan back to Solo Shrine. Let's see if they want to commit. No, it looks like they want to actually push this all the way past the keep. Big fears go down here. This is an opportunity for Denial. Kerrigan, Rich here, jumping on him, and the Ancestral is good. Immediately, the Mighty Gust from Falsec. Glorong jumping in once again. K1 Pro supplying the shields as much as he can. It's Kefin. It's looking for the Stormbolt. Doesn't find it yet. It's still a talent disadvantage, and the keep is down. 
they still have level 13 during this entire fight, and the gust was so well used. Let's not even forget about the, the scaling difference between these two teams at 15 to 12. I mean, that's a lot more damage that Black is doing every single time. And again, the, the value for hero damage for Godon just wasn't there. And, uh, you know, that's something that we've been looking towards in this draft. It's, that is the most important thing for Denial's comp because they moved away from the Illidan. They did not all in on the Illidan when they were building their composition. And so it's all about the Gul'dan. And so far, it really hasn't been all about the Gul'dan. Yeah. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah, totally right. They were just never able to really put him into that spot where they want him to be. It's an easy target for Rich. You have the tools to keep Gul'dan alive. But you can really tell how Rich is positioning himself always so that it's very difficult for Gul'dan to approach. 13 talents are on the board. Maybe now, Wolf, do they have a chance to get a kill here? It's going to be tough to do so. Good force wall going down there to kind of uh, mess up this fight here for Black. But Black is roaming around like sharks. Five manning this push now, looking to get a second keep as the Arcane Punisher comes. It's the strongest Punisher in the game. It's definitely going to do some serious work once it starts dropping down its uh, little spinny Arcanes. Oh. Big Stone goes off here as well. Divine Shield already used. Divine Shield used. Man strong. They go for Kerrigan. They try to take it down. Glorong in the middle of things. Gul'dan attacked once again as Illidan used to the Metamorphosis. Utha is down. Gul'dan is dead as well. Glorong is going to be the next to fall. Rich everywhere at once. Kyocha trying to get that gust off a nice dodge here from camera pro he will be step here but he knows this game is likely over caffeine still in avatar form here trying to buy time but he will go down and now the punisher is on the core the punisher is on the core only tacita is still alive and here comes mvp black they are going to take the first map they take the victory on infernal shrines the quick ancestor at the end of the game thrown out here and this is the gg as mvp black takes the one a dominant, dominant performance there. Control of every single team fight. I like the approach that I'll use to basically just outpush Kyocha, just kind of isolate him, bully him in the lane, um, and just ignore the Punisher. The problem is that Black Split got too much value from every Punisher, so even though before the Punisher started marching, every time it looked like uh, Black was getting the worst into the trade because of the structural damage Denial was getting, once a Punisher, Punisher came out, uh, Black did so much. And also that attempt at the bot lane with a four-man push, four yeah. push where they lost that fight, that was the turning point. Crucial point in my opinion as well. I feel really this is where it all went south for Denial. That was the moment when they had to make a big decision. And in the end, in hindsight, we can say they made the wrong one. Yeah, right out of the gates, Black just came swinging. We saw Denial try to replicate what the Koreans like to do with those early game Illidans. Didn't quite work that well for them. And then as the game progressed, I mean, we just saw team fight after team fight of perfect execution from MVP Black, whether it was the Ancestral Heels clutching it out, because Rich seemed unkillable in all of those fights. Skill-wise, yeah. I'd say they're pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they, they made all the right plays at all the right times. I mean, I, I don't think there was anything wrong with the comp on the other side. It was just a matter of execution, and that's what MVP Black does so well. I think when we talked to them, I think they said their number one strength, Kaldor, was... Well, they said their number one strength was actually like the team fighting. Exactly. Uh, it's interesting if you talk to other teams because what I feel everybody else highlights about them is their individual performance on Heroes. And that's exactly what we saw with Rich here. That carry again. I mean, I'm scared just watching it. Just, just <laughs> think if you're on the opposite side receiving that. But right? when it comes to their team fighting, though, like, yes, Rich went to town, but he also had the perfect sanctification to enable him yeah. to do that. The perfect ancestral heal to make him enabled to do that. And left and right, he just wouldn't go down. I think the macro play that we see from you, Black, is, is what I want to highlight here. Just up against kind of an unusual tactic from Denial to just hard push onto Kyocho, whichever lane he was in, because Falstad alone obviously is going to have some trouble with that. Just responding, making sure that they got as much EXP as possible out of their push so that even though they lost some of their structural damage, they got more EXP so they hit their talents first, which allowed them to team fight better. And then Rich's positioning, of course, just making Gul'dan worthless in, in that game. One of the things so, I have to say, though, what I found pretty funny was when uh, A1 Pro juked that one gust and beast that real quick. It's <laughs> like, all right, you win the game, but at least I juked you once. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all good and fun spirits here, for sure. Jay, how there were a lot of crazy moments in that game. Why don't you guide us through some of your favorites? I, I want to take a look at probably one that will be talked about. Well, so let's just pause it real quick, because I want to go ahead and highlight one thing, guys. And this was a moment, if you look at the minimap, there's Kerrigan 
All right, Kerrigan's not even at this fight. I mean, that's the biggest. This is a 4v5. You should win this fight. Now, let's roll it forward here as we continue to watch. And there's two people to watch. Let's go ahead and pause real quick. Because right now, as we see King Caffeine, he's up at the top. He's trying to do everything he can. The problem is, is that they've put so much into saving Gul'dan as we start to roll it forward now. He's gone ahead and used his fear, that horrified, to be able to get everybody out of there. But we start to see this is where plays are made. is about to hit the mighty gust. And co co coincidentally, a couple people get trapped, but at the same time, of a cleanse was used onto Glaurung. I Dream is going to be there. He's going to go down in the middle of all of that. I mean, this was just excellent execution by MVP Black, getting those two kills. The timing of that sanctification, guys, was spot on. It saved the drain life, negated. We saw the magic missiles and everything coming in from Li Ming. There was no surviving that, and there was just so much used as a defensive posturing on the side of denial that you would normally see those things used offensively. And in a 4v5 fight, that's a tough spot to be in. It was absolutely crazy. I mean, we talk about Kerrigan the entire time, and in this fight, she wasn't even there. She <laughs> was she was at the top lane. Probably Rich was like, hey, can you leave me something? I want to participate in this. And they're like, you push that lane. You stay up at the top lane. We got this. And yeah, they did. Really? Really cool that the Sanctification, of course, denies healing from both Illidan and Gul'dan. Really good counterpick when that draft is all played out. Jay, how what else you got for us? I, I want to just go ahead and highlight, before we ever even start this, I just want to, like, freeze frame it right now. Okay, there's one thing you should watch right now. You want to know when you want to kill somebody? You go after the side gate first. You don't go after anything else. You know it's down. You're looking to make plays. That's what he's doing. Now, it doesn't happen right away. And as we run it forward here, keep an eye on Rich. He is absolutely terrifying for everybody else. Nothing to be made, but he's creating opportunities right now. His posturing, he's going in. And we're going to go ahead and slow it down real quick because already Gul'dan has forced out the Divine Shield. And in the middle of all that, Rich is there, staying the Maelstrom has popped. He continues to go in. I Dream just cannot do anything. Sanctification used, as Wolf talked about, to be able to enable Kerrigan. And that's what they did. They allowed Rich to make plays. But when we drafted, as we could just run this forward, because this was just the beginning of the end. But when we talked about in the draft, it's not about just Rich. It's about the fact that you enable him and you give him the heroes. There's the B-step. I know you guys like. But you enable Rich to make plays. And that's what they did. And it was re repeated. And as you said, he doesn't even need to be there. That's how good this team is. 4v5 fights. And then you just enable one of the most deadly players in the entire world. This team is on another level right now. I don't know about you, Wolf, but what also like totally fascinated me in this situation was Tyrael once again. He set those up. He was the one to engage to cut Gul'dan off from the path of retreat, and he did it twice. Yeah, All, Tyrael is, is, in my opinion, like one of the hardest heroes to master in Heroes of the Storm. If you're a newer player, stay away from it. You know, <laughs> uh, you don't want to pick judgment. But when you watch this at pro play, uh, I think it comes down to coordination. The two teams I think historically that have been the best at using Tyrael were Tempest. When they were Tempest, uh, afterwards not as much, and MVP Black, the two teams that were in the finals for last HGC Global Championship. And I really feel like the, the reason why these Korean teams are so good at using Tyrael is because they practice together as five all the time, 10 to 12 hours a day, all together, all five of them, not two of them at a time, three of them at a time. These guys have played so many hours together in this five-man group that when they do this, if you watch them scrim, if you watch them in comms, there are no comms most of the time. They do all of this without speaking a word. So it's just, it's the powerful coordination that you have from practicing that much, that consistently. Well, that was an incredible game number one from MVP Black. We're gonna go to a quick commercial break, but when we get back, we're gonna have game number two between Denial and MVP Black. The Heroes of the Storm Fall Championship is sponsored in part by Intel, T-Mobile, NVIDIA, and Republic of Gamers. We cannot wait to share with you guys what we have in store. Welcome to BlizzCon, boys. For Azeroth! 
We're exploring a lot of new locations. We invented some brand new characters. The world could always use more heroes. We retake when we first did LizCon back in 2005, we had no idea what to expect. Are we ready to begin the costume contest? It is amazing to feel part of this thing. How'd you guys feel about today? Are you excited? So much more than a game in a box. We have so much to show you here today. It's just all fun and games. Have fun this weekend. Take care of each other. Have a great BlizzCon! of the storm. Prepare for Heroes Brawl, the new game mode that breaks all the rules. Rated T for Teen. Championship is sponsored in part by Intel, T-Mobile, NVIDIA, and Republic of Gamers. Welcome back as we are right in the middle of Denial versus MVP Black. I'm Salah Jake with J. Hal Kaldor and Wolf respectively. And that very first game in this series was well, not all that unexpected. It's just awesome watching these guys play. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I've been I've been enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, you're spoiled. You don't count. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to talk to you too. But think about what. So King Caffeine got interviewed after game number one, and he already assumed that MVP, MVP Black was going to win. And he's like, yeah, he's like, we'll be playing MVP Black in the next series, even though they hadn't even played yet. Right. Do you think that he kind of wishes that he would have been like, man, I really hope that they lose because I know that they're going to win, but I don't want to play them. <laughs> like they're, they're they're pretty good team. Well, I mean, of course he doesn't want to, but I think I think uh, I think what uh, King Caffeine is is really saying in the interview is that he knows it's likely inevitable and doesn't want to you know look weak as a team. I mean, he's like one of the best players, defending BlizzCon champion, uh, two global finals this year. Uh, he knows that he's the underdog, but they clearly had something pre prepared there versus that draft. I love how they avoided. Uh, you know, just fighting on the on the shrine. Just let's push instead. It was a cool strategy. Didn't work out in the end, but uh, what are you going to do? You got to give a lot of credit to MVP Black in that situation because the way they handled that, the way they were able to defend, especially when it came to the second shrine spawn, they rotated so quickly. They left Rich alone on Kerrigan. Kerrigan excels at dealing with the skeletal defenders very quickly, and everyone else was able to not only stop any pressure from being put on the mid lane, but they maintained the soak. So. That's not something they're used to dealing with. When they make those calls to just avoid the shrine, they tend to get a lot more value out of it. Yeah. What I would really have liked to see here is if that four versus five fight that they had at the bot lane would have worked out a little bit different, how that would have influenced the game. So I guess we can all agree it was like the turning point in the match. From that point on, they just like trailed behind too far. But just imagine if they don't play so aggressively in that situation, just play it a little bit calmer. I think there was so much pressure that they mm. felt forced to jump in there. If they get the fort and maybe get a kill with it, yes, they're going to lose a lot top, but that game is still even. I would have loved to see that. 
Alrighty, well, our next map is going to be Brax's Holdout. Wolf, take us through it. That I will. Brax's Holdout is one of our newer StarCraft Battlegrounds, and I guess Kyler and I love StarCraft is a great game, and so is this map. So here are how the map works. Basically, there are two points that you can control, and if you stand on them, it's very similar to channeling anything else. Uh, you need both of them at the same time. So let me show you. If you have both of them actually at the same time controlled, a meter will fill up, and basically it's these uh, areas here filling up with Zerg. They will you know, of course, unleash the Zerg if you win the objective, and they'll go down one of the two lanes. It is a two-lane map. Now, if you win it by a, hard, a large margin, you get Guardians, which are uh, units that used to be in StarCraft 1 that can shoot at range. They push really, really hard. The most important thing to note about this map is because the objective is so powerful, if you win lane, you usually win the objective, and then if you win the first objective, the game could snowball to hand very quickly. So the early game on this map is insanely important. Now, thinking of heroes in general and like some of the hero picks that we tend to see here, one of them that stands out to me is Rexar. <laughs> and I knew it was coming. Well, this is one of iDream's classics. Yes. And Rexar excels because you can throw Misha onto that point and safely hold it very easily. It, it's it has been played, and it's not out of the question. As we take a look at Rexar, there, it's it, I, you say. It's about Rexar, but if you look at the trait, it's more about Misha. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's actually just the trait, right? And it's about being able to send your pet onto that point, as uh, Jake was talking about. I personally still think they should just rename the hero and call it Misha, <laughs> because the pet, in my opinion, is the backer of damage. That's, that's how it works. Yeah, I mean, obviously controlling the, the point that way can force a lot of rotations uh, to that area, and it can hold that for a long time. And if the shrines are held, if the, even if they're contested, if they're whole, held, they have to be taken away then you still build charge. So Misha can just hold it and then just stay there for a long time. And if a rotation comes up, even if they get it, you've you've spent a lot of resources to deal with this. I think some of the ways to deal with Rexar are to push the lanes hard, kind of similarly to what we saw in the previous set instead. Just control the opposite one and push the one that Misha's on really, really hard. Well, the draft for game number two is ready, so let's jump on into it. It's going to be interesting to see how Denial can perform. Now, Jay Howe, you and I both know America very well, being our region. And let's think back to the show match, the showdown that Denial played against Gale Force. How did that go? It didn't go well, but again, the map had just came out two days before, so I give them a little bit of leeway. But Malfurion being the first ban, you know, you gotta even win or lose there, you get instant experience, especially, you know, they went up against Gale Force, who's been one of the top teams in North America. So you get that instant experience. And of course, it's been played, you know, over the Nexus games and things that we had over the last month and a half. So the experience is there, plus practice. I'm not as worried, but at the same time, we haven't seen a lot of this out of MVP Black either. They haven't played on this map a lot. No, not a whole lot. This is a map that really was implemented at the end of Super League at the very end of the tournament. Uh, and it was legal, of course, along with the, the heroes that came out at the time. Uh, Alarok. So it was released basically at the exact same time for the finals. It was the first time we ever saw it there. I will tell you that if it's not banned here, I think immediately uh, MVP Black will consider taking Rexar. Obviously, we talk about the Rexar all the time. In Korea, Rexar for a while was considered basically insta lock uh, and insta first ban on this map every time, like you were talking about. But it looks like they're going to go with a safer Muradin pick this time around. I like the ban on Alarak, by the way, quite a lot. We have been talking about him having uh, or going to have like a huge impact on this tournament. And on this map in particular, I feel like he is just so dangerous. On these lanes with the two lane setup that you have there, if you get that quick combo off and you get that kill in, that can really turn the tides fighting over the objective. So good ban from the Nile. And Mirrodin, I mean, this hero has been on the top of the <laughs> list for so long. Make no mistake about it, on this battleground, you are gonna fight. You're gonna team fight. There's no avoiding it. You have to control both activation points, and at some point it's gonna kick in. And you can see heavy priority over Warriors as ETC being first pick for Denial. Another really interesting thing to think about is it's a two-lane map, and although it might not be the largest battleground in the pool, we still see a, a large prioritization on those global heroes. Being able to quickly rotate to a map in an instant with something like phase shift can turn the tide and take control of that objective for a short period of time. And even if you only hold it for a few seconds, it adds up. Ooh, gonna see the I, early Latykus lock in here. This I, is pretty interesting. You just gave up Vala. And if yeah. MVP Black goes Vala in the next side, oh, instead! All right, this, oh, this, data <laughs> guys. this is a call out. <laughs> no, 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 guys, number one wave clear on Brax's holdout in this game, Gul'dan. All right, I'm a happy panda already. Like, this is good. Because first of all, I mean, ETC has a pickup after Meridian was taken. We kind of expected it. 
Kefin loves the two heroes. Then we have Tychus. And Gul'dan once again with the Morales right behind him. So the wave clear prioritized here by <laughs> MVP Black. This is just beautiful. I'm loving this game already. Let, let's, talk about that. Uh, let's talk about that. Why particularly Morales? Let's talk about why that's such a good uh, backup pick to go to I mean, at this point, you can even you can get so much use already out of your medevac alone if you play that right. If you can push one lane, you can quickly transition to the objective if you want to. There's and so much you can do with the mobility on the map. Jake has been talking about global as well. There you go. But you but, can also life tap for days. Yeah, life yeah. tap for days, <laughs> and Morales just sits there and heals you. Yeah, I think the, the combination of the Morales and Gul'dan is what we're going to see, especially towards life tap. I think that this is a pick that they didn't want to necessarily show here, but I think they are in a, in a bit of a almost fan service moment because of what <laughs> happened in the previous set. And I think this is pretty cool because Korea has told us, you know, we've, I've been talking to them for a long time, even since the finals, that they don't think Gul'dan is very strong. And they're surprised that Europeans and, and North American players are talking about and saying that he could still be viable. So really curious because it, it's, it kind of goes against everything I've heard from them, uh, even recently this week, about this hero. I mean, the lifetime combo is going to be insane, but I really hope that they're going to use Medivac to just outplay a little bit. Because we don't see that as often as I would really like yeah. to. We have a global, sometimes seen backdoor strategies with Medivac, but I feel on this map, if you play it right with the objective, you can really outrotate an opponent super easily. Since it is a two lane map, and you can just like go from one to the other quite quickly and maybe snipe a quick heat. Okay, speaking of objectives, so we saw Leeming banned out by MVP Black, and I like that because one, Morales, you know, you're going to get the best single target healing in a game from Morales. And that's not denied. But at the same time, a little bit of splash damage goes a long way. And heroes that have that, Sylvanas, Lunara, I'm looking at Sylvanas right here. Sylvanas can also help enable that Zerg wave if you get it, but you have to get it. So team fighting is crucial. But you throw out that, that W there from Sylvanas, it spreads a little bit of damage. So there's potential, I think, I, I, I feel like um, I always reference this interview because I think it's it's so true. When I, I interviewed Snitch in Valencia, I always said like Sylvanas is kind of a win more hero on, on maps like this. As we see the Kerrigan pick come out, I think the reason why we don't see Sylvanas versus Black is because you, it is kind of somewhat more of a win more hero. You need to win those fights, like you said. And against Black, that's going to be so difficult that Sylvanas becomes more of a hindrance than a help, uh, oftentimes. I love, by the way, how they basically just, like, swap key heroes yeah. from game one to game two. <laughs> the Kerrigan comes out for denial, and so this time it's going to be MVP Black with the cool Dan Morales in the back trying to keep them safe. This is absolutely amazing. I love this. And this is Glaron's, you know, time to shine. If he wants to yeah. show that he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a player like Rich, this is his calling. So it's going to be really fun to see how he can do it. It's him saying, like, yeah, Rich, it wasn't too bad with Kerrigan last game, but it's time for me to show you. Outside. Right? Okay, one of Rich's most played heroes, and he plays this hero better than anybody in the world, Thrall. Thrall is still on the board. Thrall has good survivability. He can stay alive in team fights, not necessarily take the, the heals away, the resources away that Morales will be providing. So I think that's a threat. And the way that he's able to play, oh, man. Oh, man, this is also a, a, a very common combination we saw in Korea for a very long time with Saranda and ETC together. We call it Soranda <laughs> because so so is cow in Korean. But uh, <laughs> this is definitely something that it, it feels very old school. You know, it feels like something we would see in Tomb of the Spider Queen, sometimes on Infernal Shrines, not so much on this map. Well, this is this is C9. This is last pick Rexar. Like <laughs> just about in every situation, this is the stun meta. When Cloud9 or it now Denial was at their prime, it was during the stun meta where it's all about blow up. I definitely know that right now. Dreadnought is really happy about his. He's a huge <laughs> fan of Taranda and he really loves the hero <laughs> to death. So I think right now there's in the back room just Dreadnought sitting there's like, hell yeah, that's how you do it. Go for that, Tyrande, and combo her off with the stuns of ETC and Kerrigan. For those that don't know, that's actually the complete opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you spoil it? Because like <laughs> if I don't say it now, then we won't have the opportunity. But picking double warrior into Tychus, what do you guys think about this? Well, what is Tyrande's, you know, falter with. She falters with running away. She doesn't get sprint to level 13. She has very little mobility. And if you're able able to dive on her with something like Chen and Muradin, it's but do you, very is tough. Chen the solo I, laner in, I, this, I, in this setup? I think it's it's very likely he will be. Also the thing about Chen here is that Morales like can heal him very easily from a from a safe distance with the composition that they have with Murden as well. So it's gonna be hard to get on Morales. So Chen could just drink brew and be healed. The only thing I'm worried about with Chen is if he's alone without Morales, he's very vulnerable versus all the CC that we already have with the ETC, the Tychus, the Taronda. His brew will be interrupted a lot. So he is gonna need that heal to stay alive.
One of the things that I want to point out real quick really is that Denial in this case with ETC could very well go stage dive again. They did it before in previous games too. And now keep that false with the Mighty Gust in mind. If you see that coming and you're quick to react, you can actually just blow everybody else away and the ETC all of a sudden plays a one versus five. So that is scary when I watch this and when I just... What? Whoa. I... Okay. Listen, Denial is known for making drafts weird and making the other team uncomfortable. This they took makes, it too far. <laughs> this makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Not that making us uncomfortable, exactly. But, but think about Tahaka in the instance is the traditional way that we look at Tahaka is he needs to be able to make use of his global by playing on a big map to where he can be able to rotate and do things like that. But we're looking at him now on a two lane map. Yes, it's a big two lane map, but we're looking at him on a two lane map. The surprise factor, he you hear that huge growl that comes up, and I, I just wonder like where does Dahaka fit into this team comp? I don't think he does uh, at all. I mean, it, it, they're looking for Morales picks, but you've got Chen and uh, a Murden with this composition. I don't think the that Dahaka is going to get any value. In fact, I've been very adamant about this, but I think Dahaka is is pretty weak in the current meta and it needs some tweaking. Even I, I don't but, think he fits. But go back to what Caldor said. Uh, th uh, and this right now, the the tools that they have to be able to isolate a single hero. Every single person or every single hero on that side has some way to deal with anybody on that front line. If you isolate somebody, the damage potential is there. The isolation literally is there <laughs> and the CC is there. Like the one thing that I also want to highlight is that when we're talking about wave clear for a moment going into Rexis, this is one of the things that Denial does not really have if you compare it to what Black can bring to the table. The Haga with a buff on his AoE can actually work against that a little bit. So I feel like they have a global mobility right now, they have the potential to isolate a hero even more, and they also add a bit of AoE here. I'm not really quite sure if I like that pick or not, but I feel like this is like the reasoning that's behind the choice. So there could be some fantastic plays here, but one way or another, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm, I'm blown away by the draft. I want to see how this goes. I think the one thing that I really do like about the, the Dahaka after thinking about it a little bit is just it makes the Taronda a little bit less vulnerable. Having another big body like that that can peel for her and do well in that situation, I think is nice. Yes, their solo laner, might not be as threatening as something like Rexar, and Chen will probably win that lane on his own. But the Dahaka can certainly work, and we'll have to see what I Dream can do. I, I predict we see less than three grabs in this game. Wow. I, I don't think it's going to happen. We've seen Korean players attempt to use Dahaka against this very team. In fact, I don't think I think you guys are thinking grabs are going to happen a lot. I'm not thinking they are. Okay, maybe if in the middle of a team fight he's like in you know point blank you range, he might get a grab. Now. But like, you already said okay, they wouldn't I'll get more than <laughs> <laughs> Someone count, okay? I don't think I, I don't think, think they'll get three in the first two minutes. I don't think grabs are going to be happening a lot in this game. It's not going to happen until they get cleanse. Like somebody's getting power slid on. Somebody's getting Tehran to follow up. Somebody's getting hit with a grenade. Somebody's getting hit with a Kerrigan combo. I'm just saying, there's opportunities. I mean, there are opportunities. there are opportunities. There are opportunities. I'm never going to lie to you. I mean, if you look at this draft, I mean, it's 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 insane. This CC, it's it's out of control. I mean, every single hero has some sort of disruption. Even Tychus with his grenade could help set this up. I just don't think that Black is going to let it happen. I, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm trying to look at the silver lining because they're trying something different. They're trying something innovative, and I'm trying to see it from their perspective, and I think it can work. I'm just, I, if you want me to get out of the way here, like. <laughs> 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 well, we're going to have to keep our eyes on those grabs and see if iDream can land them. We are ready to jump into game number two between MVP and Denial. Take it away. We are definitely ready. This is going to be an absolute fantastic game that we're watching right now. And once again, to the left side in blue we have the american team it is denial with apm on tirana glorong is going to show us his kerrigan skills i dream on the haka k1 pro playing tight gas and king caffeine on etc and their opponents from south korea over here we have kyocha on faust and merry day on lieutenant morales rich on chen sake on Gul'dan, and sign on muradin this is going to be absolutely crazy. I cannot wait for this. Not only do we have Gul'dan, we have Morales in the mix. And just look at that draft for Denial. They are playing it with a carry can. So now we're seeing Glorang trying to yeah, teach Rich how it's done. I'm not quite sure if that's going to work out, but I guess we're going to witness it. Yeah, we will find out. Already Saga getting a little bit of value from the hero. Now, I talked about Dahaka a lot, and I, I did make a really bold prediction that uh, may come back to, to haunt me. Um, but we'll see if, if he can actually find value here. The thing is, it's the range on Dahaka's grab is so small that you really have to be aggressively in the fight. He could be burster during that time, he could be killed, or he could just simply be avoided. And, uh, you know, this putting a, a big emphasis on this hero that does a lot of CC, does have a decent amount of wave clear. 
in theory, again, just like the Godan pick from Denial in the previous set, does seem great. But when you look at the skill of this team, I just don't think they're going to get caught by, by this very often. However, Caffeine yeah, in really good waiting. spot here. Doesn't look like Black Nose, but they don't have vision, so they're going to play it safe. And look at that. <laughs> Not even going to happen. <laughs> Stop going right there. Try to slide in, and then boom, the Stormbolt to the face. Talking about the Stormbolt on level one, we have perfect Storm taken here for Muradin. We've already seen that in the previous series. Scouting drone, great talent on the map to take because you have vision that will tell you early on about rotations. But I just want to say once again, the control that we have for Denial is pretty crazy. I mean, we've been talking in previous tournaments a lot about Carrigan plus ETC. They're going to try to stack this up with the Tirana coming in, of course. Oh, look at this. All the damage going down to Glarung here. Sign gets out. Kyocha trying to get the kill there. Not able to do so, but still, the value was real. We've been demounting APM there for just a moment. And uh, we do see Rich up here is dominating the top lane. Right now, obviously, Chen is one of the best solo laners in the game and will dominate top lanes a lot of the time. This is no exception. It's really not a an issue here of iDream's play. It's more of an issue of the fact that just in this meta right now, Chen is stronger on this current patch. But he's going to be up there for now, and he has that global presence to come down. Now, the beacons have spawned. And already, Denial will control the southern one, but the top one, I don't imagine, will go in their favor. Black, fantastic players. They are still have to be very careful about those stun combos at the bot lane. There is so much potential for disaster here. Sign already trying to go for Glorung moving in. We are seeing Saka with Glorung, sorry, with the Gul'dan trying to find an angle where he can push some damage out. But both of the teams are soon going to reach level four and the next talent. That's right. Rich actually taking a lot of damage here, but Sign is coming up. There's one hook. <laughs> There you go. Start the counter. Dream does get it off here. Kyocha coming up as well. There's the stasis here. The burrow. I Dream taking a lot of damage. He will be killed here. And this shrine will be taken by MVP Black. The patience that we just saw from Sign once again before he threw out the storm ball. You could see those dodge attempts that we had, but there was just no escaping it. He waited for an eternity, and then it was a three versus one. All of a sudden, Dehaka goes down, but still each team holding one of the beacons. And this bot beacon obviously is very difficult to take, especially when you have the, the commitment of Sign rotating to the top lane to you know get that kill, to get that uh, shrine relieved. But we could see them commit to a fight here in a moment now that they have that beacon control to the top. And we do see that basically Denial is trying to push this lane really hard to make sure that can't happen. And so far it's been successful. Now Sign, they don't have vision of him here. So let's see if he actually makes a rotation down once they get under those towers. While well, we're waiting for that to happen, I want to note real quickly that we have different builds here. Looking at Gul'dan, in the last game, the quest talent on one was focusing on fell play, whereas now we have the Echoed Corruption, which is, I would personally say, the more dominant talent when we're looking at comparative esports. Ah, another grab up at the top, Rich. Eating a couple of those tower shots, and uh, Wolf, you're getting pretty close to losing your balance. I know, so. man. It's not looking good. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't call those game-changing hooks. And in fact, by the way, during this, uh, the bottom beacon was taken, so you will have to, uh, you know, relinquish the top one with the rotation up here. Now, this is a really scary rotation here. What they're trying to accomplish here on the sign. Sign is very happy with this, in fact. And here comes Coach in. Great. Uh, knockback there from King Caffeine, though. That had not happened. That could have been disastrous there. But the beacons are channeled currently for Denial with this move, and they do gain 28% of this first beacon. And you know what I love about this game so much already? It's so tense. I mean, there's no one, one kill yet, but you can always see how they're angling for additional kills, and you're just waiting for that one team fight, and all of a sudden just explodes, because that's what both of these combos are really poised for. I can't wait for that to happen, but Glorung here trying to defend, going for their stun combo, but falls dead, easily healed by Meriday. Yeah, but at the top, it looks to be a 2v2 exchange, but still, Denial getting the better trade of it, because they have control of the wave, forcing Rich to choose between a, a tough fight and or losing EXP, but it looks like they're gonna actually control the second beacon as as well here, which will again channel for Denial Esports in order to get now 50%. Here comes Kyocha. They're going to fight now. Oh, man. King Caffeine so low. Can Kyocha secure the kill? Nice juke there, but it's not going to be enough. Rich will get that kill and will get this channel, but still, even though they got two kills, that's the second kill they've gotten this game, I'd say Denial is massively ahead because they have the better beacon. 
they have a really nice speaking status right now, 72%, but still that fly in from Fallside from Kurochat did so much for them. Without it, there was just no way to really take ETC down, but it was just the right amount of damage. Sign on the other hand in a bit of trouble, but Rich already jumping in to help him out as one of the mercenary camps has been fought over Meriday in the back, healing them out. K1 Pro has to retreat as he's been attacked as well, but now Caffeine is back to business. Uh, they're just fighting for too long though. This is going to allow nearly a 100% beacon for Denial and down they do they do finally secure this but uh not a, a lot of value in these fights in fact that fight didn't secure them a kill it just allowed a denial this very first beacon and I, I said if you get the first beacon oftentimes you win the game because you just it gives you so much value and it really starts to kind of it gives you your heroics first a lot of the time and yeah. the, the game could snowball as a result 98 percent that's quite the statement that we see here in both of the teams despite the two win uh, two kill lead that we have for the Koreans are currently on level eight. So dead even in experience, Denial playing already a much, much better game than a map number one. Yeah, and here we go. Those are the Guardians I was talking about over there. We are gonna see a little bit of a fight here, but the Guardians are gonna allow this to push so strong. They're so, they have so much range like they did in StarCraft Brood War to push um, and do damage, as you can see here. So the defense is going to be very tough for Black. Now, they do have Gul'dan and Falstad, so that's going to help them clear this, but this is going to do a lot of structural damage no matter what. And in fact, the ammo is already gone on these turrets. First thing they do, break the gate. Allow Kerrigan to go for a target if someone goes too far out. Give her vision, and that's what they do. Caffeine the entire time, waiting at the sides, trying to wait for that stun, and of course, MVP Black trying to defend. K1 Pro too far out, and he is down. And here comes the fight. They are just simply going to try to get as many kills as possible. Glaurung does survive here for the time being, but he's very low. He will go down eventually. APM goes down as well. Caffeine so, so low is going to be killed here and it will be a four-man wipe they don't even get the fort now i dream uses his global presence he was top before but the second that the wave came out he switched lanes he swapped down to the bot lane so they get a lot of exp but at the end of the day mvp black gets the better trade here and it looks like they're just simply going to ignore the objective and take team fights a big mistake from denial had they been safer there they would be massively ahead right now. What a blow to the confidence of Denial. They were the ones with a 100% objective pushing in, and now they are an entire level behind, and they lost way more than they gained there. K1 Pro, two Fowdens, Tychus. He is a priority target for the opponent. He dies first, and then it's a cleanup job with Dehaka not even joining the fun. It's just, it's unfortunate because I feel like this was so telegraphed. Um, the one moment where they were swapping lanes where Dehaka was going down, they didn't have vision. And that's the moment where you really just have to sit, take a step back and get out of, get, don't, you know, don't get that far forward. You have the Guardians pushing. This is such a powerful Zerg wave coming. You don't need to be that far forward. And they just got punished so hard when level 10 was on the table. It felt like a bit of like miscommunication, to be yeah. quite honest with you. I mean, K1 Pro uncharacteristically standing way too far out. Everybody else moved back. He's the only one who doesn't react. And then he's an easy pick. Right now, though, the teams are both on level 10, and that might be the game changer that they need here. Sign good positioning, making sure that he just like guards the flank and moves back immediately as he sees denial approach. Now, Mary Day just going to heal him right back up. Not completely, of course, his trait's going to heal very, very quickly. But they're pushing this very, very hard. They're leaving the top. They don't mind about that because they already did so much pushing there. They can just walk away here. Oh, they got this camp as well. And the top is just totally unmanned right now. So even though Black commits five here, uh, until Dahaka rotates up top, there's nobody there. Looks like it is going to just simply be Chen that goes up here to clear this top push, but Dream's going to be there as well. They might need to send someone else because, again, this is when the beacons are up. So you can see a difference in playstyle here, whereas Denial is supposed to focus on the objective, and Black is just trying to play team fight games and taking objectives afterwards, which is one of the cool things about Heroes of the Storm. The objective is very powerful, but you don't always have to focus on it. Yeah, you're totally right about that. There's several ways how you can approach a match like this, and that's what they do. ETC with a stage dive, but Falstead, he's also in here. Once again, the slide. Glorong is trying to join, and this time they could finally go for the kill. They're going for side, but the heal is there. Once again, K1 Pro is starting to jump in as well, trying to follow it up on Muradin, but not securing the kill as Kyoja is followed by Glorong's carry again. Oh, here's a meta back here. Sake comes in. Kyoja is still alive. They're on the chase here. Glorong jumps in. Missed Lunar Flare there. Tychus is the first to go down. And oh, look at all the stuns and fears. Wow. Now it's ABM that's dead, and Sign is continuing the chase, and this is an 8-0 game. Glaurung the next to fall right now, making it a 9-0, and these team fights every time have gone to MVP Black, even though the rotations 
uh, you know, and the Shrine control, the objective control, is normally in control by Denial Esports. A team fights every single time a one by MVP Black. What a fantastic control in that fight once again by MVP Black. Absolutely amazing here. As you said, the rotation, it was started by Denial. They were the ones who went aggressive, who nearly took down Murden, and then it didn't happen. They couldn't kill him, even with Tiger sliding in and trying to just drop him. He never died, and instead of going back or anything, he turned around, walked back into the fight, got a kill before he jumped out again. The individual skill level of every single one of these players on the side of MVP Plaque is just outstanding. Yeah. I mean, Kyocho's positioning as well. I feel like Denial really did a little bit too much chasing on him there um, initially, and that allowed MVP Black to get better into a footing. Uh, I like the split pressure that we're seeing from iDream. We're seeing it a lot, you know? He's trying to make the best of a, wor of a bad situation here, but this is just an insane push. Look at all the heals going down on Design. He will stay alive. Rich. Body blocking and oh, yet another sick gust by Kyocha. Caffeine goes down. Now that's two dead already. Another fear and Tehran is the next to fall. Glaurung all alone here. I dream coming to see what he might be able to do, but Rich will probably finish him off. And I think this will be game. It's going to be a wipe here, Calder. Wow. I dream desperately trying to get back in the hall of storms, but Rich oh, blocks him again and he will go down. Oh my god. <laughs> Unbelievable. They deny him the retreat and take him down. Game number two in favor of MVP Black. What a game. 11 minutes and it is over. A 2-0 victory for MVP Black. 15 and oh, and I believe we saw three hooks exactly if I was looking at correctly in that game from Dahaka. But MVP Black with an insanely dominant performance here. And the reason why I was really favoring them going to this game is, is not even just because I know they're, they're from my region and they are the, the most consistent team in the world, but what I was really focusing on here is the draft of Denial felt like it was all over the place. It was just five big blasts of CC. But if you look at the overarching team fighting with the composition that MVP Black had, they were gonna win every time. They lost lanes every time. They lost the objective at the beginning too, but they were able to take team fights and those team fights won them the game. There's no better way to put it. Everything about their team fight capability was top of the world. I mean, denial in situations where they clearly should have had an advantage. They could not find those kills. You were talking about the isolation on Muradin. Surely he was going to die there. But no. I already know. <laughs> but no, they couldn't find him. They couldn't find Falsehead. They couldn't find any gap in the play of MVP Black. I don't think there was anything. I mean, team fighting right now is at a premium, and right now MVP Black is at the top of the list. And what we've seen from them in every single team fight, they don't falter. I mean, very rarely do we see anything go wrong, and they make... I, I see plays from this team that I don't see from other teams. I agree. Like, the one thing that I want to say again is that we had such an amazing early game for Denial where they were able to get 100% on the objective, and that's the moment when you really have to get an advantage. This is the moment you push in and you try to snowball it a bit. This is where you reap your reward for playing well and getting the objective in the first place, and that didn't happen. Exactly the opposite happened. One word. Gul'dan happened. Yeah. Gul'dan being the one word. But that's what happened. <laughs> I, it definitely did a lot more value on the side of uh, MVP Black there. The Echoed Corruption pick, I think, is the better one, uh, even though it didn't really matter that much in that game as the game ended so quickly. I do agree with you, Calder, as you said in the cast, that that was the better choice. It was just simply that the CCs the, and the big, you know, kind of, I almost want to say gimmicky uh, style that we saw in that game from Denial wasn't good enough, and Black outplayed them at every turn. Well, yeah, I mean, once we got towards that first team fight, but I have to give it a lot of credit to Denial when it came to just their ability to rotate around and take control of those shrines because they made great use of Dahaka with the global presence. And this is a team that in the showdowns, in the earlier matches we saw from them on this battleground in particular, they struggled on it. And they show that they have really learned how to play the map much better than they did in the past. I, I'll, I'll say this about Denial. Strategically, they're good. Very but I, I think the fact that they ran into a really good team fighting team right now was kind of what did them in. So I, do, I don't, yes, that last game was kind of quick, but and they were pretty dominated at certain points. But I don't think Denial, after what we saw here, I think they stand a much better chance getting out of this group and going to top eight easily. I would agree with that. I really think the early game, the way they played, the way they rotated, it was really well done. They could have even picked up a few kills. We've been talking about it. They're just Their heroes just barely escaped. It's just really that the team fight of MVP Black was so strong that once the team fight really started, 
denial kind of fell apart. I'm not quite sure if you can blame them for that. I think you have to admit that at this <laughs> point, MVP Black just shows there that they're completely different level here. I mean, speaking of team fights, Jay Howe, let's relive one of those team fights. This one right here is one of my favorites. We talked about that 100% Zerg wave. I just actually, this is uh, towards the end uh, just a little bit. Let's go ahead and pause it real quick. I think we might have missed that one just a little bit. But the thing is, is the Falstad play is we'll roll it forward here. Just let's run it slow forward. And you can see a little bit of isolation over here. We have a couple members that seem to be isolated and you think this is not good. It's not good at all, guys, because look at that. Mighty Gust secures the isolation. Let's just pause it and let's appreciate what they did because not only did they recognize this beforehand, but they're calling it. And the response from Falstad, you've got a well there and you've got two members that are just walling you in. You are not going anywhere. And that's like a feels bad man moment because <laughs> you you just like, what do you do at that point? And we'll just run it forward to watch this play out. I mean, one goes down, two goes down. It was basically the beginning to the end, but there was absolutely nothing you could do when you're caught in there. And you can see they continue to put the pressure on. Gul'dan did work. The Horrify was there, isolating heroes, and just constant, constant pressure from MVP Black. And you, you talk about a feels bad moment, uh, feels bad moment, but like that was Kerrigan actually just popping her ult when that happened too. So you not only do you isolate the heroes, Kerrigan is all of a sudden standing there with her Melster was like, well, I guess that doesn't do anything now. <laughs> I, I, I want to go back to these Kyocha gusts. They, he knows the angle. When someone is caught, when someone's isolated uh, at an angle to where everyone will be gusted away from them, he's done it both games here. And I, I want to also bring up that Kyocha is one of his least played heroes, even though he has a very wide hero pool, is Falstad. He only plays it in situations where they need double mage damage because they're looking for burst and they're looking for gust potential. And he's already shown us, like, you know, if you look at Black, what are we going to learn from them in this first group stage is we're already learning that they're really prioritizing Falstad quite a bit, uh, especially about the gusting. Well, they played incredibly well, and they'll be moving on into the next phase, but we've got another match lined up for you. It's going to be our lower bracket match between Reborn and Burning Rage. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a bit.